Sometimes it's not about losing, it's how you lose. And when you've been losing the same way for years now and nothing changes, my investment in your results starts to get low. I am sick and tired of the Bulldogs being okay with being mediocre. And I want to talk about it. So let's go. In case you missed it, the Dogs went down to the Ds by seven and a half goals in front of a, the worst looking 44,000 strong crowd I have seen. There was not 44,000 people there. Oh my goodness. You're telling me that that ground could nearly, that attendance could nearly fill Marvel Stadium? Bull, you know what. Now, the Dogs lost in the same way they've lost always. Their good players were fine. Without the ball, they were terrible. And their list is nowhere near the quality that everyone keeps telling us in the media that there are. Now, I'm not putting this on Kane Corns. And he is as frustrated as anyone. It's not his fault or his problem at all. But I remember coming out of 2021, that grand final loss, and being like, they can put themselves into a really good situation because they've got one of the best lists. And then you look at their players, and even their guys now, Bont, English, Liberatore, I thought Trelaw was pretty good on the weekend. Bailey Dale, Norton, Jamari Eugle Hagen. I like the potential of Cody Waitman. I, I wouldn't put him in the same tier as those players, but he's definitely not one of the worst. The rest of them, though, are not great. And their bottom 10 to 12 players do not compare with some of the best depth teams in the competition. And however you feel about the quality of their players now, their top end talent do not have what it takes to get over good teams. And don't forget, and I said this about Melbourne in a video, so I'm in no way separating myself here. It's not like they lost to a powerhouse. I love the way that Melbourne responded. I loved the way that Clary got involved. Petrarca was still good. Gorn was excellent. Jack Billings, when he's not the sub, is actually a good player. Good job, Goody, in figuring that out. Christian Salem was pretty good. The list goes on and on. Probably missed some really obvious names in there as well. Van Royen, Cade Chandler was really good as well. But it would not have surprised me if you thought Melbourne and the Bulldogs were relatively similar in quality coming into this game and they were bitched off the park. Pretty much. This dog does not have a bark and does not have a bite. You've got to remember that with 16 minutes to go in this game, they were only down by three scores. Like, it wasn't as if the game was out of reach. Think of it like the Collingwood-Sydney game. It's not like they were 51 down, kicked the last three, put some respectability on the scoreboard, and you kind of go, well, they did their best. No, this is a team that was in the game up to their eyeballs, and then they let it slip. Because the Dogs are... At their best, elite, and even at their worst, can still get things going with the ball. With the ball is not their problem. Jamara kicked a little bit inaccurately, still looked good. Norton up the ground, had an impact at times. But they're still too good forward short. Whether one of them is that medium size, say, Bailey Fritch type, or Jack Gunston type. Not that they're the same player, but you're... Uh, your link between your smalls and your talls, and they're still another small forward short. Well, that's just obvious. But without the ball, they just gave up territory so easily. Daz, you might be saying, your football club did that. Yeah, we finished third last last year. So that's to be expected. But this club, this list is now two years and one game removed from a grand final. Their age profile is still good. They have some. Of the best players in the league. Libba, underrated. Bond, if he's not first or second, he's the third best player in the comp. Tim English, top three ruckman in the league. Without the ball, they suck. And some of you are going to think it's the defense. I don't disagree with you. I like what I saw from Buku Kamas for a lot of this game. They still need help down back. Sam Darcy is a part of that. He's still way too young to be that guy you depend on week in, week out. But his talent is enormous. Got no qualm there at all. Their defense is a problem. But again, relating to a Hawthorne, North Melbourne as well on the weekend can attest to this. If you make it difficult for the opposition to take territory off you, a bad defense can be serviceable. 
And the Dogs didn't even do that. The amount of times in that last quarter, Melbourne walked the ball out of stoppage, which ironically is how they won the grand final in 2021 in the first place. They just walked the ball through. But the way that they were able to let Alex Neil Bullen when he went up the ground, Tom Sparrow at times, Judd McVie especially, Salem, these guys, good kickers and good movers and shakers out of their back line that they were allowed to take territory, even if it was only to the wing area. And then it became a bigger problem. They still had winners on the ground. Like I said, Chandler was really good. Ben Brown was allowed out the back a little bit. They took their set shots for the most part at important times. But the Dogs happily don't stand on the mark. Yes, stand and let an opposition player walk around you. That can be a bit of a problem. It can be. A bigger problem is that you never do that. They happily give opposition teams five metres on the mark because they're going to try and close the gap. Five metres is not big enough of a gap to close down a beautiful kicker with three steps or even two. It's not enough. This entire system looks backwards and they are not going to go anywhere. And look, I could be wrong here. They could win the next 10. This might look stupid. That's fine. But a pattern of negative behavior needs to be called out. Bulldogs keep doing this. How Bevo survived the game against West Coast last year that cost them a final spot was effectively get the old guard of assistant coaches out, circa Damian Hardwick at the end of 2016, get the new crew in, and the same shit happened. Nearly every other team in 2024 looked a little bit different. You want to know how? I'll prove it to you. Carlton are going more direct and are trying to get an extra winger, whether it's Ollie Hollands or Blake Hakers, both forward and defensively of the ball to create a seven on six and a seven on six as best they can and attack teams between the arcs. Richmond don't want to do the handball game anymore. Want to kick more. It nearly worked. They nearly beat the Blues. Sydney are going direct and Isaac Heaney and Chad Warner are becoming a problem with their centre forward rotations. They're becoming more unpredictable going forward because they're not as buddy-centric anymore and Tom McCartan is still their most important player. The Pies are different because they seemingly don't give a damn that the season started. We'll see how they go. The Giants are different because their wave of pressure between the arcs is getting better. They're helping their defence improve. North want to play faster, and of course they're playing younger, with mixed results. They came back within five points of the Giants. They then fell away. The Bombers between the arcs want to go more direct as well, and they want to create space inside their forward 50 because Peter Wright against three tall defenders is not going to work, which is why the ability of Matt Guelphy, Archie Perkins, and Kyle Langford deep in that second half was able to help them overcome an inaccurate Hawthorne. Hawthorne want to be able to take territory on the opposite sides of grounds and expose teams with quick ball movement. The downside to that is they can get killed on turnover, and as we saw, because James Warple was the only midfielder that showed up, they can also get killed at stoppage as well. Let's fix that up and get Will Day back as soon as we can. The Cats want to go fast with their young players, Max Holmes and Ollie Dempsey. They want to go slower with their veterans. Dangerfield and Duncan want to be the guys that set up the ball, of course, as well as Tommy Stewart. The Saints want to rebound off halfback, take as much territory as they can, give Max King in their forward space, and let Jack Higgins be a problem as well. Gold Coast are implementing a 2.0 Richmond plan. And what I really like about what Damian Hardwick is doing is that he is introducing a, a, sorry, an, not a, an evolved version of what made Richmond successful. They're 2-0 now. They were probably lucky that Adelaide didn't come back, but they should have kicked them out of the game earlier. But you can see the difference. The Crows, I'll argue, we didn't see a lot of in terms of what's different. Their midfield is still way too slow. This video might have been about them. But they haven't done this for what seemingly is six bloody years in a row now. So they'll get a tick. But don't worry, I'll address them if they do the same shit against the Cats this week. I can assure you of that. Who am I missing? Uh, Port Adelaide. Look, they played West Coast. How different they're going to look is really dependent. But it is perfectly obvious that they want to get the ball in the hands of Houston, Farrell, Ryan Burton, and these really good kickers. And they want to be brutes around the stoppage with Zach Butters showing his toughness. Ollie Wines back in there, and Rosie is the cherry on top of a very classy cake. And of course, Jason Horn Francis in there as well. Charlie Dixon had a really good day out, and Todd Marshall and Jeremy Finlayson can hopefully do some goal kicking practice this week. West Coast, hard to know from them, but you know, their young kids were okay. Chesser came on as the sub really nice. Harley Reid's debut game was pretty damn good. 
The hype is still over the top, but the kid is obviously a talent. And then you get into uh, Melbourne. Melbourne's difference at the moment is their defensive structure can still be sacrificed a little bit, I feel, but it is still the same, and hopefully natural improvement goes there. Fremantle want to be able to rebound effectively. Sarong and Ryan were amazing down there. Alex Pearceweight played one of his best games of all time now. Brisbane, a bit like Collingwood, don't really give a damn that the season has started so early, remembering that they did play in the grand final and in opening round, which means they played on the last Saturday in September and the second Thursday in March. Let's keep that in context there as they try to build their season. So right now, you could say maybe Brisbane, who have got a reason, not an excuse, a reason. You've got the Crows. Yeah, okay, let's put them on the same pedestal there. And you've got West Coast. Every other team, we can see a noticeable difference. This mob, we can't. That is a problem. Their good players are not good enough to get their bad players over the line. They have a severe lack of B-plus talent, and frankly, I'm sick and tired of it. And to answer a frequently asked question here, whether you've made it this far or not, no, I didn't tip the Bulldogs. In fact, in my workplace tipping competition, we have a lock system in which if you get the lock right, you get an extra tip point for the week. If you get your lock wrong, you lose one. So if you got nine out of nine, for example, you would have got your lock right. You end up with 10. If you got eight out of nine for the weekend, but the one you got wrong was your lock, you would end up on seven points. My lock was Melbourne this week. So it's not like I'm coming from a place of they stuffed up a tip or even a bet or anything like that. Not that that's how I operate, but still, I'm sick of this. As someone that tries to watch as much footy as I can, I'm sick of watching them. It's the same result. They'll win some home and away games with their best players like this, but unless they can get their non-superstars or their non-stars even up to a better standard, they're going nowhere. How long do you give Bevo? I don't know. But the new plan of new assistant coaches needs to kick in at some point because if they don't make the eight this year, he can't stay. Straight up, he can't. It's inexcusable. Because let me ask you this. If Richmond did not get close in 2017, apart from winning the flag, but if that had gone the other way and Richmond didn't make the eight, he was gone. A thousand percent. Same rule here. Look at Justin Longmuir. We thought, and I thought, he wouldn't make the end of the year. How did they go in round one? Kicked Brisbane's ass. Massive difference. I don't know what the emotional investment or the effort is from the players. It would be rude and I think quite stupid of me to assume what they're thinking mentally going into a game. But Freo, Bulldogs, they met in the 2022 elimination final. Both of them had down years last year. Both of them have coaches under pressure and only one of them played for the coach this week. And Freo played better opposition. So, that's it. I'm done giving a shit about the Western Bulldogs for a while until they fix it up. Bulldogs fans, am I being harsh? Am I overreacting? If you're not a Bulldogs fan, what do you think about the way that they're going? Is Bevo's job untenable in a state of bother? Where do you see this football club going forward? Comment below. Let me know. I love answering you guys. Like the video if you like the video. Subscribe. To join the Daz Talks Footy family, fingers crossed the YouTube algorithm is looking after me. I will see you for Wednesday's video. Hope your team had a win, and if not, hope they bounce back next week. Goodbye.